I'd like to say to all of the young innovators, Black Lives Matter. could nonviolent action be used against ISIS? You Even can the be a of part of, of the biggest scientific, scientific discoveries of our time. On the day that ISIS captured the Syrian city of Raqqa, the streets were empty, except for one. Swad Nofal, a schoolteacher and mother, walked to ISIS headquarters carrying a sign that said, don't tell me about your religion. Show it in your good deeds. Members of ISIS held a gun to her head, but nonetheless, she stayed for two hours. The next day, she made another sign, and then another. She actually protested outside of ISIS headquarters every single day for three months. Members of ISIS tried everything to scare her away. They spit on her. They hit her with a truck. They set off a bomb close to where she stood, but they didn't kill her. And she recalled hearing one 17-year-old member of ISIS asking, why are we letting her live? By now, I hope this question is something that you have in common with this young man, and we're going to build a little suspense and talk about that more later. Being able to read a situation of conflict accurately is a skill. People are trained in this. They study it like heads of state, the military, political scientists. But there's one thing that all of these groups have in common. They learn how to read violent conflict. Meanwhile, over 80% of political upheaval in our world today is nonviolent. That means that very few people in the world are able to accurately read the conflicts that are defining our time. And this is a threat far more global and dangerous than ISIS. It's what I'm going to call nonviolent action illiteracy. I do trust that all of you will recognize that Swad Nofal was using a tactic of nonviolent action called protest. But many people believe that protest is what nonviolent action is. And so throughout the world, people in every country, almost every country at least, are using protest to try to create change. It would be like trying to write a book using only one word. For two years, I had the privilege of working with a man named Gene Sharp, who's world famous for studying nonviolent action and explaining how it works. He has a list of 198 methods of nonviolent action. Protest is only one of these methods, and it's the weakest one. The stronger methods tend to fall into two categories, nonviolent disobedience and nonviolent intervention. And I'll give an example. In April of 1961, the president of France, Charles de Gaulle, announced that he would grant independence to Algeria. He soon found out that his generals based in Algeria were not too happy with this. And so they planned to fly to Paris and take over his government. But the generals couldn't get to Paris. People from all over France drove to the city and filled the airport runways with their cars. The generals just didn't have a place to land, and they ended up going into hiding. It turns out nonviolent action is extremely effective. Two researchers, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Steffen, have crunched the numbers on the past 100 years of conflict, and they discovered that nonviolent political movements are more than twice as likely to achieve their goals as violent movements. They're even more effective against extremely authoritarian and extremely violent opponents, and with far, far, far less civilian casualties. So that's how I chose the topic of my master's thesis at Harvard three years ago. I started with an open question. Could nonviolent action be used against ISIS? But what I discovered was so much bigger that my question fell apart. But in its place, some really new and surprising questions arose, and I want to share two of those with you today. But first, we'll need some backgrounds. I've spent years combing through the history of ISIS, and I've been confronted again and again with the same conclusion. At every stage of its history, ISIS has grown as a direct result of its participation in violent warfare. And ISIS knows this. It's in their private correspondence, it's in their propaganda, and it's in every strategic choice that they make. What we know today as ISIS was started way back in 1999 by a Jordanian man named al-Zarqawi. He was kind of a nobody. 
He sent letters to bin Laden for years, asking to join Al-Qaeda. But bin Laden was like, this guy is way too violent. Let's pretend those letters got lost in the mail. But then fast forward to 2003, and the US invades Iraq. Zarqawi moves his people there to fight, and his ultra-violence makes sense in the context of war. He loses some people on the battlefield, but he gains far more in new recruits, and suddenly he's a big deal. Bin Laden asks him to join Al-Qaeda, and eventually his group gets a special name, the Islamic State of Iraq. He's soon killed by US forces, but as a direct result, a far more skilled leader comes to take his place. The current leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, had never even held a gun before the US invasion of Iraq. He was captured and held at Camp Bukha, known as a torture camp, for four years during the US surge in Iraq. Many people think that the surge was a success, but in the words of a US general, the surge didn't win anything. It just bought time. And during that time, ISIS was building a stronger organization. By 2010, al-Baghdadi was the new leader of ISIS, and he filled 70% of its top leadership positions with people he was tortured right next to in Camp Bukha. Half of those men were not even religious when they were captured, but they had converted to ISIS ideology by the time they got out. Then it's 2011 and a massive nonviolent uprising occurs against the brutal Assad regime in Syria. And the people of Syria are accomplishing what no one thought was possible. Assad begins caving to their demands, and over 30,000 of his military defect. ISIS stays in Iraq. They don't fit in in the middle of a nonviolent movement, and they know that. But then, nonviolent action illiteracy strikes, and it strikes hard. The defected military and the international community have the same brilliant idea. They say, wow, this nonviolent movement's doing really great. Let's send weapons and start a military campaign against Assad. That'll help them out. But then you have the start of the Syrian civil war. And al-Baghdadi immediately sends his people to Syria, where the group has a new purpose, because they have a new war to fight. They start growing faster than ever, attracting recruits from across the globe, and IC becomes ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. So you can see, maybe by now, one reason why my question fell apart. Could nonviolent action be used against ISIS? Well, violence has caused ISIS to grow every step of the way. So I started to ask a new question. Could anything but nonviolent action be used to defeat ISIS? When the US began airstrikes in Syria in 2014, ISIS sent a message to President Obama saying, come on, is that all you can do? Is the US and its allies unable to come down to the ground? They said that because they want to fight. And as a general rule, we probably shouldn't do exactly what ISIS wants us to do. But the fact is that we probably will, because we literally can't see another option. So I want you to visualize this. This picture depicts the essence of nonviolent strategy. It shows how every government depends on numerous institutions in society to hold it up, like the education system, the armed forces, the media. If people in one or more of these institutions refuse to cooperate with the government, it will eventually collapse. Now, as ISIS has become to function as a state, it also has come to depend on all the institutions that any other government depends on. So we could ask again, could nonviolent action be used against ISIS? But it turned out my question was again a little misguided. Because even though it doesn't always hit international media, people in Syria and Iraq have been using nonviolent action against ISIS since the very beginning in every single institutional setting you can think of. All I can do is give a couple of examples. I cannot do justice to the bravery and intelligence of these people. But for instance, take the economy. Recently, ISIS was only giving the city of Raqqa four hours of electricity per day. In response, businesses throughout the city closed their doors in a massive strike. ISIS fired some guns into the air, but there wasn't much they could do because every single business was closed. And within a few days, electricity was restored for business hours. Or take the media. 
In ISIS-controlled cities like Sarakeb, youth are risking their lives to graffiti messages on the walls, like this one, which means, we love life, if only we could find a way to it. And groups like Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, are using social media to show the world what's happening to their cities under ISIS, and they're continuing, even though many of these people have been killed or imprisoned. And actors from inside of Iraq, whose family members have been killed by ISIS, have started a weekly comedy series called The State of Myths. I have a couple of stills from the series. This shows al-Baghdadi hatching from an egg, this one, a cowboy, Satan, and a truck. And I don't always know what's going on in the show, but I do know what the purpose is. The show's creators believe that getting people to laugh at ISIS propaganda is the most effective way to prevent it from working. And even though the Kurdish people have been targeted by ISIS for genocide, some of them have responded by mocking ISIS in return, and it's gone viral. <laughs> I kind of wish you could watch those guys this whole time instead of me, but you can look them up online. <laughs> and believe it or not, organized religion has been a source of resistance. When ISIS tried to force the imams of Mosul to pledge allegiance to al-Baghdadi, 34 imams refused, and they've been barred from preaching, but hundreds of people show up to one of their silent mosques every Friday with crowds spilling into the streets. And when ISIS started branding Christian homes in Mosul with the letter N for Nazarene, other Ns started appearing throughout the city with the message that said, we are all Christians. Or take the education system. When ISIS took control of Mosul, every single family refused to send their children to ISIS schools in a massive boycott. And teachers in the city of Deir Ezzor have refused to teach ISIS curriculum. And people in Syria and Iraq are also creating alternatives to ISIS and to Assad. For instance, they've created the Karama Dignity Bus, which is a mobile trauma center for children. Women are creating centers for literacy, first aid, and computer skills. One of these centers, the center of Messiah, was burned down by ISIS. But literally the next day, the woman came back, cleaned up, and continued their work. And then they wove the largest Syrian revolutionary flag in history. So who are these amazing people? One of them is Swad Nofal. I believe she lived because she knew how to use her own power. She was known and loved by everyone in Raqqa as the best school teacher in the city. She was actually the school teacher of the very members of ISIS who were holding a gun to her head. She recalls laughing in their faces and telling them, you've become exactly what you used to stand against. And she recalls seeing fear in their eyes. So maybe the question isn't why did she live, but why haven't she and others like her won back their countries yet? ISIS is about 20 to 30,000 members strong. If you add everyone else holding a gun in Iraq and Syria, you have 450,000 people, which is a lot. But the total population of adults in Iraq and Syria is 37 million men and women. A group the size of ISIS isn't exerting so much control over a group that large, not to mention us in the international community, just because they have guns, and of all things, swords. It's because they know how to act violently. And we understand violent action more than we understand the power of nonviolent action. But what if things were different? What if we put our support behind the tens of millions of nonviolent citizens in Syria and Iraq rather than dropping bombs and sending weapons? What if we sent them resources and training in nonviolent action so that they can take their isolated acts of resistance and grow them to a scale that would defeat ISIS and, for that matter, the Assad regime? What if we sent resources and created zones of stability so that they can grow their institutions and spread their messages? 
I'm not saying a change like this would be easy or that it would happen all at once. But I will tell you the first step. People like you and me need to become literate in nonviolent action and more literate. Read books about how it works. Watch films about its history. Learn how to explain to other people how it's every bit as complex and powerful as military warfare. Because otherwise, we're just recreating what we expect to see. And unfortunately, we expect to see violence in the Middle East. And even worse, we expect to see the citizens there and in many other places in the world as helpless victims. But the reality is far, far bigger than that. We're just not used to looking at it. It's the immense power of the majority of people in every society who just want to live life, not destroy it. And if we can learn to understand how that power works better than we do now, then we can learn to support it. And one day, if you or I are living under an oppressive government or living through a civil war, I hope that our friends around the world will be more advanced than we are today. I hope that instead of sending weapons or dropping bombs where we live, that they'll send us this kind of support that will strengthen us and empower us to break free. Thank you.